70% of the people, they don't believe our government tells them the truth. And that's really good because they aren't telling us the truth. Some kid smoking a joint goes to prison and treated monstrously. Doesn't history tell us that marijuana has been used as medication for thousands of years? But what if a doctor says, hey, Ron, it's not a bad idea for you to start smoking weed. Would you do it? So today we're in the office of Dr. Ron Paul. If you don't recognize this face, he ran for president multiple times. Once he ran back in 1988 as a libertarian. Right. And then you ran in 08 and 2012 as a Republican. And an interesting fact about the way he ran his campaign, when the internet was just coming up, nobody was doing a lot of campaigning through the internet. And his concept and beliefs that he had as a libertarian wasn't yet accepted by a lot of different people. He went out in the first 24 hours, in a 24 hour period campaigning only on the internet, raised $6 million at a time when nobody was raising money. And then you hear about Obama's doing that and all these other guys doing it, but he was a MySpace guy, a YouTube guy in his 70s. And his audience were 20 year olds, 18 year olds, all over college campuses, similar to what Bernie Sanders did recently. Bernie Sanders, many say, took a page out of his playbook in the marketing campaign that he had when he ran for office. So here we go. Dr. Ron Paul, Thank you, good Patrick. to be here with you. Appreciate it. Thank you for making the time, by the way. The more and more I study you and, uh, and find out about you, just your philosophies are very interesting. Today, I would like to address a few different issues. One is your book and the Fed. I'm always fascinated by economy. Uh, I'd like to talk to you about marijuana. I know you have some strong beliefs about marijuana. See where you stand about that. And I have a uh, fun challenge for you. I'm curious to know if you'll take that challenge. You, you, you're probably thinking what the challenge is. We'll get into that part. A uh, little bit of the IRS, a little bit of Trump, a little bit of that stuff, and then obviously part of your story. So before we get into those issues, I was talking to you earlier. You were saying you were raising a family, Pittsburgh, five kids. You're the middle kid, and you're coming up. I know you went into the Air Force. I know you ended up being a doctor. I know you delivered over 4,000 babies. So the typical person that runs for office is normally an attorney. You are not the typical one. Neither you or your son, Rand Paul, who also ran for office. When did the inspiration come for you to say, I'd like to one day enter politics? Never happened to me. But I was inspired to try to promote a message and talk about a message. So the first time I decided to speak out in a political sense, was in 1974, which was a Watergate year. Republicans were dead in the world hot water. Nobody wanted to run. At that time, Texas had three Republicans. Now we have like 35, you know, congressmen. So it was all Democrats. So there was a in void. In Texas. Yes. So there was a void there. And then the Republicans were just starting to, you know, the shift from Democrat, mm -hmm. conservative Democrat to yep. Republican. So I thought, well, oh, you know, I'm going, I'm going, I want to speak out because I was exposed to Austrian free market economics, mm -hmm. the Mises, Hayek type of approach. And I was convinced they were on the right track. And I was convinced also that nobody in Washington ever heard of them. So I thought, well, I need to talk about it. I want to get that message out. So I went to my wife and I was very, very busy practicing, love medicine still. I never disliked medicine. I never said, I'm going to give up medicine. I'm going into politics. And so I told my wife, I want to run for office. In the 70s is when, when the Bretton Woods broke down and we had inflation of 15% and interest rates of 21%. That was really exciting stuff and very, very dangerous. I wanted to talk about it because they Carter were- Carter era. Yes. Well, no, that would- uh, Is that pre-Carter? Yeah, that's it, right. That's, that's Carter right. era. Ford was in, in office too. It was, it was said through the Watergate years mm. and we had Nixon era, but it was very, very exciting, but very, very dangerous. So I went to my wife and I said, look, I want to talk about this. She said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to run for Congress. She said, what in the world would you want? She had no expectation. No, like no. she had no idea you're going to be doing this. No, we, we, this was my introduction to her to tip her off what we, you know, I was planning to do. And I said, she said, well, that, that could be very dangerous. I said, well, why would it be dangerous? She said, you could get elected. <laughs> <laughs> I guaranteed her totally impossible. That's not my goal. My goal is just to reach a few people. You really said this. You said there's no way oh, yeah. in the world I'm going to get well, No, there. I told her it's not going to work. And she and, and she's totally non-political, a little more political now than she was then, because all she wanted to do is raise the kids and and, and be a wife. And, and you mother. also had five kids yourself. Yes, right. Yeah. So uh, she, she said, no, she said, you're going to win. I said, no, no, I'm not going to be Santa Claus. I'm not passing this out. I want to tell people that you have to work for a living, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, mm -hmm. the, the whole philosophy. Mm -hmm. And she says, yes. And she said something that stuck with me because people have come and thrown it back at me. She says, 
they're going to like what you say because they're going to believe you're telling the truth. And you know, in a way, that is what I heard so often, and that's why people in my district would support me. They say, we know you're telling the truth, we don't agree with all your libertarian stuff, but we like the idea that you're telling the truth. And you know, and I imagine you have observed at times the starvation for truth right now. Just think of what's going on in our politics. Nobody knows who's talking about the truth. It, yeah. It's totally void. It's, everybody's a f in fake news. You know, both sides accuse the other side of fake news. So that was why I got into it. But of course, uh, it uh, opened up uh, political goals. And sometimes success in politics has to do with luck. You know, being in the right place at the right time. Was there a book? Like, did you read a book? Like, the, like who was the? I know you were a captain in the military. You were a captain in the Air Force, and you were a doctor in the Air Force. So you done a. You were in Tehran back in 1970, I believe, when you were not 1970. I think even earlier than that, in the 60s when you went to Tehran, right? So I know you've been all over, but was there like a guy in your ear saying? Hey, Ron, read this book by Hayek. Hey, Ron, read this. Was there somebody no, doing no, that? Not one person, but I think people, and the one thing I encourage people at, say, a graduation ceremony, stay curious. Look for the truth. Mm -hmm. It's up to you. You have to go looking for it. Were you a reader? Were you always a reader? Yeah, that, that is what motivated me to read, you know, at the time. And then I would look around, and I came across the Foundation for Economic Education, and that was Leonard Reed's group. It was one of the you few. You always talk about Leonard Reed. Yeah. You're a big fan of Leonard Reed. You, Leonard you like his education. And, uh, he was in, in New York, so I got to know him, but he provided books. I would buy the books through them. No internet, you know, the names, Mises, and got his books, and Hayek, and Rothbard, and Sandhold. So I was really fascinated with Austrian economics. So my motivation in those years was to study and to understand. One philosophy that Leonard Reed taught me, he says, don't worry about what you're going to do. Look for the truth. And if you become knowledgeable, he said, somebody will seek you out and somebody will use you. So don't worry about the plan. Wow. No plan. Somebody's you know, going to seek you out and somebody's yeah, going to use and you. And one of the most pleasant things that ever happened to me, every once in a while an individual would come, another congressman, I'd be up there voting all by myself. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether you noticed, there was a time when I voted by myself quite frequently. And he knew I wasn't, you know, a loud mouth trying to demagogue anything. They would come and sit down and say, Ron, why are you doing this? It doesn't make any sense. Uh, you're either not voting with anybody or you're voting sometimes with the liberals. But it was a sincere question. And I explained them briefly the philosophy and, and, and those several were converted. You know, over because that's the key. Conversion yeah. is the key. Well, to influence and to have them be curious, and then for them to study it. Another example that I just love was uh, with Walter Jones. You know, I follow up a foreign policy of non-interventionism, and he felt like uh, he was lied about the Iraq War, and it upset him a whole lot. And he voted for it, and then he saw what happened. He voted for it. Yeah, and he he he's punishing himself still about that, but he came. And we had a lot of conversation. He turned out probably my closest friend in, in Washington. But he went from, you know, just going with conventional wisdom of, of the hawkish Republicans. And all of a sudden he said, hey, you know, there's something more to it than this. So that pleased me a whole lot. 1974, was media as influential as it is today? Did they have that much influence? Because I remember the first debate that was a national debate on television was... Uh, when Nixon was doing it off radio, because it used to be radio, Nixon did well. But once it was TV, Kennedy excelled because Kennedy did well on TV, but Nixon didn't. So was this when America was kind of transitioning into the power of media? Was it barely getting into it? Oh, well, it, it, that was in the 60 election where they had, where Nixon lost, you, you know, to Kennedy. No, it was a transition gradually, you know, and uh, the debates would be, have occurred. They used TV, ever, you know, ever since the Nixon debate. But it changed things a whole lot. That is when they introduced television recordings of us on the House floor. And I said, I've never voted for a government program, but I voted to put the cameras on the House floor. <laughs> they need to see what we're doing. But that sort of backfired because everybody spoke to the cameras, you know. They knew how to handle that sell in, in public themselves. relations. Yeah, they knew how to sell themselves. <laughs> so how much of the politics, when you look at the politics, and I see somebody talk and I say, okay, this person makes sense, what they're saying, but they're not a good salesperson. That person doesn't make a lot of sense, but they're a good salesperson. This person makes zero sense, but they're a great salesperson and they know how to play the game of politics. 
How important is selling and learning how to play the game of politics, of pinning against each other and not taking a lot personally? I mean, I see that being a big strength of Trump. How big of an influence do you think those two other parts are as well? Well, I guess it's what, what your goal in life is. You know, if your goal in life is to be a congressman, you do things completely different than, than what I did. Young people now, when I uh, go to the college campuses, they'll still come up and they say, you know, I understand what you're saying. What am I supposed to do? And, you know, how can I go to medical school and then go to Congress and all that stuff? I said, if that's your goal, forget it. It shouldn't be your goal. You know, it's back to education. I don't believe the politicians who make these plans and lay the plans and join the parties and become a precinct worker and work your way up and learn how to raise money and go to the professionals. You're not a fan of that. You're the fan no, of the I think inspiration that's I think uh, that's the way it's done. I think it's wrong, and that's why the wrong people go. I, I think it also ought to be a more issue-oriented. So if somebody comes up, I don't like the demagogues, the noisy stuff, but if somebody comes up and they're very serious and they say, Ron, I disagree with you because I'm a socialist and we can. One person that was close to that was Barney Frank. Barney Frank and I got along real well and we had a lot of disagreement, but we had a lot of agreements because he was a progressive and we'd agree on civil liberties mm -hmm. and we, we did legislation on, on drugs, the, how we regulate that and some on foreign policy. It was the issues that counted more than anything else, but I think most people go in um, because they want to be a congressman. I think you should want to change people's views. To me, that's the only thing that counts. The Converting. government that we have is a reflection of the prevailing attitudes of the people. So I'm more interested in changing the attitudes of the people and understanding why liberty can be defended rather than saying, oh, I need help, you know, I might be out of work. And uh, people are poor in this country, and this is why we need authoritarians to go to Washington, to take money from this group, and take care of everybody else, and teach you what your pri personal habits ought to be. I just refuse to accept that approach. But do you really believe liberty is possible today? And here's what I mean by liberty. There's two different ways, right? One of them is conceptually. So it's good for us to keep talking about it, because at least the right concepts will stick, but will we ever have full liberty? We'll probably, guys, let's face it, we're never going to have it, but let's keep talking about all this other stuff. Are right, you coming from a place stuff thought of? No, I fully believe liberty is possible in America. Uh, oh, yeah, well, liberty is to some degree, but perfect liberty. I mean, mankind is not perfect. So define liberty. What does liberty and libertarian mean to you? I'm so, curious. So, uh, it to me is one thing on, on that subject of uh, perfect liberty versus perfect communism. You know, it just doesn't exist, but the goal should be liberty. So, for me to pursue what I have been doing for these many decades, is that I have to have a definition. What do you mean by liberty? Why is it important to you? Is this, is this a social belief, an economic belief, or a religious belief, or you know, what is it? I have come to the conclusion that uh, the most important issue or rule that should guide our lives is something that has been universal, and I think we're making progress. As a matter of fact, I think that we can do a lot better and we're in a move and there's a lot of reasons why I'm an optimist, but it's based on a concept which is called non-aggression. You can't commit aggression. And it's very simply, don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, don't hurt people, and don't kill people. But if all the great religions endorse these things. If everybody did that, can you imagine how much more peaceful the world would be? But man is fragile. And they aren't, mankind is, they're not perfect. So they will always get away from that. The, but the big question is, is do you want the authoritarian government, people who want to be in control, send them to Washington to make sure that you're a better person? That doesn't work because then the monopoly use of aggression and control is given to the government. You know, in, and, and the rule that follows this is if you and I have disagreement, Okay, you know, I, I agree with you, Ron. I'm not going to steal from you, and I'm not going to hurt you, I'm not going to kill you, and all these things. But all of a sudden, government's exempt from these rules. The government lies to us, they cheat, they counterfeit the money. We go off around the world, we're going to police the world, we kill people, we, can't, we drop a bomb every 12 minutes right now on foreigners. It's just totally out of control because the governments don't obey the rules. And, but people don't address that, they keep saying, 
put me in office. I'm a dedicated right winger and I want to be in there and have my rules. Or when somebody else comes across, no, I'm compassionate and I will steal the money from this group and give it to this group and I will create perfect equality for everybody. Well, they ought to think about equality under in the justice system is what they ought to mm. concentrate on. But I think the government always reflects the prevailing attitude of the people and therefore politicians have a lot to say about that but they're very unimportant they're very very unimportant politicians are very unimportant very unimportant overall long term Mises is more important and nobody's ever heard of him but if you want to move to a freer economy and understand that, for instance right now we're being challenged with this notion of, of tariffs I'm, I'm really pretty shocked about the support tariffs are getting but it's a misunderstanding of economic policy but the prevailing attitude uh, should be that people have a right to buy and sell their goods and services and that is what uh, free markets teach but the people get the government they deserve in many ways sometimes it's hard to get rid of a bad government but the government right now reflects a philosophy of interventionism a planned economy inflationism central banking social welfare program policing the world you say well that sounds like you're against the Democrat Oh no, maybe you're against the Republican. They're both the same. There's too much bipartisan. You're saying Republicans and Democrats are the same. In many ways, philosophically, the basic philosophy is the same. They believe in intervention. They just have different management styles. They might pick out, well, we want to redistribute the wealth. I want this group, you want this group. So, but they endorse interventionism. So, they endorse government power, and that's what has to be challenged. I got a question for you then. So you ran in 1988 as a libertarian, right? In 08 and 2012, you ran as a Republican. Why didn't you run as a libertarian again in 08 and 2012 to change the game instead of running as a Republican yourself? Well, a lot more people heard of me in 08 and 12 than they did in 1988. So it was a marketing, marketing strategy. That yeah, you had more and I'd than been in Congress, else. and parties mean very little to me. Even though I'm a lifetime member of the Libertarian Party, I've spent all my political career as a Republican. It doesn't matter. The simpler it is, a concept like you look at Trump, ran Trump said what? Make America great again, right? It resonated. It was a simple campaign, and people were just fed up with politicians. When Obama ran, Obama was what? Dream or change, right? What are we changing? I don't know what we're changing, <laughs> but we're changing. So voters are like, this is cool. Let's change. This is cool. Let's make America great again. Do you think partially the challenge with the libertarian concept is the fact that the message is being delivered by such super smart, intelligent guys like you, like Peter Schiff, like some of these guys that people are sitting there saying, I, it kind of makes sense, but man, I'm having a hard time understanding this. Talk to me as if I'm a sixth grade, you know, level four. Okay. Would, but would you say that could be a reason? Well, what I, I think you're not emphasizing is there's been tremendous change to get this message out. That, is, that was I true. I fully agree. Yeah, I, but I, just think of the progress we've made, and you even mentioned it in the introduction. The Internet helped me. Six million in 24 hours. This, I mean, it's fantastic. The people that you reach, you can change things because you're changing people's minds. But if you're saying, well, you got to, if you join the crowd and say, well, anybody about Trump, we got to get rid of this Trump. He, he's real evil, this kind of stuff. Okay. And, and that, that is all political chicanery. But it has to be uh, philosophic, which is not easy. But that's where the progress is made. When I went to Washington in 76, nobody ever heard of Mises or the Federal Reserve needed auditing. Right. I mean, it, and the, the early on, I live in a Bible Belt district, and I took a position on the drug war. No drug war. It's evil. It's monstrous. Prohibitions don't work. You can get rid of it. And I thought, well... There it goes. Bye. <laughs> They're not going to reelect me now. And I thought that came up when I was out and went back in again. But they never held it against me because, because the idea was out there, but they were afraid to say it. So many families had already been hurt because of some kids smoking a joint, goes to prison and treated monstrously. And here now they're saying, you know, is, doesn't history tell us that marijuana has been used as medication for thousands of years? Why don't we think about using it again? Just yesterday it was announced that we might use it. And that's ideological. And I figure you might say back in 88, Ron, you talked about drugs and all that. What good did you do? You've talked about it, you know, in your congressional campaign. You talked about it in the presidential campaign. But all of a sudden, 
you know, we did it. I can I consider it a great victory. I think you Ex made massive progress. You were the face of Libertarian for a long, I mean, you made a lot of progress. Some people will give you more credit than some of the other guys that originally started it because you got the message across the board. And the toughest part with you, where I have so much respect for you, is you were able to connect with an audience that others had such a hard time getting to, the younger audience. And a message that, I mean, look at the media today. You would assume if the left, the liberals, the left, the Democrats control what percentage of the media? Matter of fact, let me ask it the other way around. What media platform today in America is right outside of Fox News? What else is right outside of right Fox? Right wing, you mean? Right wing. Well, yeah, see, I don't think in right and left. I think in authoritarian and non-authoritarian. They're all authoritarians. You know, just about everybody yeah, but on TV. philosophies, to, to talk about conservative economic philosophies, that is not going to be on the left. That's going to be on the right. To talk about constantly giving up social programs just because let's tax people higher. Yeah, but, and, but and, that's a fiction that Republicans are better than the Democrats on that. The Republicans are the ones who have introduced the legislation to increase government control and abuse of the medical care system. Oh no, it was Obamacare, you know, that sort of thing. But previously, one time the vote that took the longest in, in uh, well, I was there maybe in history, it lasted about eight, 10 hours, they had to pass prescription drug program. And because it was a Republican thing, it was Bush. And we stayed up till three in the morning, you know, until they got the votes to support the drug dealer. I mean, well, they are drug dealers, the drug industries. It's run by corporations. So naturally you said drug dealer. That's so funny how the first thing you <laughs> they said are drug dealers. dealers. Well, they're dealing, they're dealing in abuse, I'll tell you, because they're at the FDA, then they're in big drug companies and all. Someone's getting paid so, good. Yes, but they, have the, different, but, they have different people they're supporting. Is, is it fair to say, you even said it earlier when we were off camera, CNBC when Tucker was there before he got fired, when he supported you, in the 2008 convention that you guys had with Jesse Vince or all these other guys that showed up. Is it fair to say that if you were to say MSNBC, CNN, you know, uh, Time Magazine, Money Magazine, Fortune, some of these magazines, some of these platforms are leaning more towards a higher tax rate and maybe Fox is gonna say, let's be a little bit more limited government uh, on the lower end. Would yeah, you agree I with that you, part? Yeah, and I think you're pointing out an important thing because uh, intervention can go either way. Intervention can be bad or good, but it's the intervention that I want to to uh, challenge. Sure. But yeah, you were so supportive so. of George Bush initially when he came out. You were kind of a little bit optimistic about what he was going to do until all of a sudden the government started getting bigger and bigger, and he hired more. Right? The limited government became well, bigger. Well, are you ch talking about George W. Bush? Bush. Uh, well, I think the the strongest statement I ever could have made was he used to say in the campaign that we should have a humble foreign policy and that we shouldn't be policing the world. You know, his, his statement was thrown out there to appeal to a few of us. And I thought, well, maybe, but Trump does that too. Okay, so you're saying, let's find the truth. Fair, I wanna find the truth. You found out the truth because you talked to Leonard Reed and Leonard Reed gave you these books that he would say, here, read this, read that. And you went through it. And then he said, if you keep talking the truth, eventually someone's going to notice you and they're going to find a way to use you. Fair enough. So if you're saying that, then what is the truth? And how can I, a naive 22-year-old, a naive 18-year-old, 27-year-old, 38-year-old who's never paid attention to politics, I was a former military guy, and I'm starting to realize I'm paying a lot of taxes. Life is getting expensive. Why is this President Donald Trump? He makes no sense. This guy used to be in business. I like him. I don't like him. Some people hate him. Some people love him. Where do I get my source of the truth? Well, a lot of people aren't ever going to pay any attention. You, you have to think about the way the world works is their thought leaders, the people who run the television companies, the people who write books, the people who have programs on the air. Their persuasions are very, very important. And uh, people have to have a, a basic understanding of what they believe in. And if they don't have that, they can't hone in on, on how to handle interventionism. You. You if, you, if, you, if you endorse people? the fact that government should have this power and authority to run our life, police the world, tell us what to do, and you know, run everything, then uh, you say, well, we just need better leaders. We just need to clean up the mess. We don't want the, you know, the loafers to get on, you know, that sort of thing. It isn't a management problem. It's a philosophic problem on whether or not the government has the right to use guns to redistribute wealth. And everybody in Washington, except for about five people, believe that. They, they endorse that principle. Sure, it varies about the tax code. I read just yesterday that it said that 
this tax code, which, you know, sounded like I could have voted for it because it, it lowered, lowered taxes. But uh, there, was, there was one vote. They just discovered, oh, they're raising taxes in this area. So it's, it's intervention. And uh, I think the argument ought to be, does the government have the moral authority to intervene in your personal life to tell you how you run, should run your personal life and your social life or your religious life? The answer should, should be no. You of course, you, you don't yeah. want to go. But we take that, that answer and apply it to economics and say, should the government, you know, sort it out so that there's more equality and that everybody has, you know, being taken care of, nobody fails and this sort of thing. And, and the libertarian says, it doesn't work. It bankrupts the country. It's done by force. And the people who use it to an extreme point are the people in Venezuela, you know, and, and it doesn't work. So, and this is where we are today. Okay. We are totally bankrupt because there's been too much concession because people want to be humane and say, you can't just throw people out in the street. Is that Yet, a Republican principle or a Democratic principle? What? On handouts. Oh, it's bipartisan. Everything is bipartisan. You're saying, you're saying handouts is bipartisan. Is the welfare state okay. reduced under the so Republican me, Party? <laughs> they've been, they've had a lot of chances and a lot of big programs were let passed by Republicans. So your opinion. Okay, so how about we go one by one by one? Marijuana. What's your beliefs on marijuana? Should it be legal? Should it not be legal? Well, it should be decriminalized. There should be no criminal penalties for using uh, marijuana. And uh, that's clear cut. You have a right to do with your life and your body that you want. And up until 1938, it, it was legal. So it's just this. Marijuana added, up until 1938 was yeah, legal. Yeah, that, that is when they put a tax on it. And they, they knew they weren't allowed to regulate it because when they wanted to regulate booze, beer, and alcohol, yeah. they had to amend the Constitution. I mean, they used to put it in your food when they would give to military guys. You know, joint used to be in there. The guys used to smoke back in the days. And you're a 1935 guy. So you're saying marijuana should be legal totally and legal. decriminalized. Absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, if the question that you're, you're sort of asking is who should protect you from yourself? And nobody in a libertarian society, I cannot protect you from yourself because your habits may be the problem. You might eat poorly, you might take stuff, and you might smoke and do all these things. And governments cannot do that. Once you do that, you give up your liberties. So you always aim for the purity of a libertarian society where you're responsible. But in this response, and the young people, you wondered why the young people came my way, and they cheered me on this. I say, you know, in a libertarian society, you can do what you want. You can smoke and drink and all this, and you can earn as much money as you want, and we're not gonna take the money from you. No taxation, but if you screw up, you can't go to the government. And I would get a loud applause on that. It was responsibility, freedom, and that you are rewarded. Why do you think some people are against the concept of what you're talking about? Everybody has that instinct. I think we're all born libertarians. And then when we're two or a terrible two and we start getting it beaten out, of, then we're sent to a government school, which is considered a prison by a lot of people. And it beats it out of us. That's, it took me a lot of years to beat the bad ideas out of my mind from, uh, <laughs> from uh, grade school and high school and college. They were all teaching me the wrong thing. And so my challenge was, how do I get rid of those bad ideas? And that took me by, and it, it gradual, 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 15 or 20 years. But I think that the momentum is on our side in spite of the ups and downs, you know, that we are so, so much better. Have you ever smoked marijuana yourself? No. Are you open to the idea? Oh, no, I don't, I, it doesn't attract me a bit. So I was with Kevin Hart, the comedian. He's a big comedian, he's got 150 million followers. Kevin Hart said, if you're ever gonna, he's never, he was never found of marijuana. He said, I told my kids, the only person you have the permission to smoke marijuana with is Snoop Dogg. Do you know who Snoop Dogg is? Yeah, sort of. The rapper. By <laughs> yeah, the way, yeah. I don't know if you know or not, one time he posted a picture of yours in his Facebook page, and he said, smoke weed every day <laughs> with your picture while you were running for office. Smoke weed every day. So if we could arrange it. And would, I, I would, don't care. He's responsible for his own life. To do whatever he wants. Yeah. So, so why don't you want to smoke marijuana? Well, why do I not want to eat badly and gain so, a lot of weight? Because you don't think it's marijuana is good for you. Yeah, I, I have no desire for it, and I, I don't know. I think that uh, it is not much positive. Except, I'm not the decider. 
if there's medicinal benefits from it. They, what they did was they just legalized and they found out, you know, all these kids that have these severe uh, epileptic fits are being helped. So what if a doctor says, hey, Ron, it's not a bad idea for you to start smoking weed. Would you do it? I'm not interested in it, but I I, uh, I know some people. I mean, if you're going to be for it, wouldn't it make sense for you to try it? I'm like the 16 year old no, kid but, batting but I, in your life. You know, life. the fact is that I was a better spokesman for for marijuana than anybody you could find. I, I was an MD. I didn't use drugs. Didn't want my kids using drugs, and that's so different. Let's say I was hippish type and didn't care about anything else other than smoking, that turns a lot of people off. Oh yeah, he just wants to do this. They knew that I was being very upfront. I want to do this for a freedom reason. I want to legalize freedom. I don't want to legalize marijuana. I want to legalize freedom of choice uh, to run your own life and take your own risk. Anything, anything. And then you know how Richard Branson came out and he said, I think heroin should be legal. I think all these other things should be legal. Is your argument because marijuana is God-made and heroin and all the other stuff is man-made? Is that kind of the argument you're making? You, you know, in one of the debates, they asked me that question in the God. debate because I took the position, you know, you yes. uh, legalize heroin. So I, I said, and my answer was, it's the funniest thing in the world, and this was a religious conservative crowd. I said, okay, we're going to legalize heroin tomorrow. I want to see the hands go up on, how many people are going to rush out and use heroin? <laughs> Nobody's going to, I mean, that's not the reason they do it. And the people, and making it illegal just uh, makes it, uh, goes into the hands of the drug dealer. So okay. it's all the okay. negative things come from, from the regulation of Simple it. So question. I let people take all their own risks. So you're not for heroin becoming legal? Heroin, no. Marijuana, yes. I said, no, on my argument. Heroin would, also. Yeah, because Cocaine legal. that's why I said to the crowd, let's make it legal. How many of you would use it? And they said, no, nobody was going to use it. They answered my question. Legalizing it isn't going to encourage use. I can it. imagine a new country. Okay, Ron Paul has officially been granted a million acres of land in a small part of Australia. It's going to be called Ron Paul Land. Okay. In our country, you're make, you can You're making smoke. fun, and that's not, not nice. No, but I'm not, I'm not making fun. This is what I'm saying. Because what I'm trying to say is you say that, what market does it attract? For instance, I'm from Iran. I was born and raised in Iran. What attracted to America for us to have 41 million immigrants here is the fact that they offer capitalism. So I'm attracted to it. So I come to a place like this. But that's okay. Okay. That, I have an example yes. of that, that situation sure. which you think would be, you're implying, well, this is a little weird, is uh, we've had that at one time. Where, where did the founders come down hard on cocaine or anything? It, it, it just existed. The drug war actually... The real enthusiasm for the drug war and filling up our prisons came from the Republicans in the uh, early 1970s under Nixon. He started this obsessive war on drugs. So uh, yes, you have the intervention with the Republicans on social habits and you have the Democrats on economic habits and they both endorse each other. It's sort of like, uh, <laughs> you know, you endorse my, my deal and I'll endorse your deal it's because that's the way it is on military. There'll be some Democrats, not too many anymore, they'll say, you know, we spend too much money overseas killing people. But we'll let you do that, you Republicans, if you give us more money for food stamps. So, okay, that's a fair deal. And what has happened to our debt? It's skyrocket. Okay, so you're not coming from a place of what's better, what's worse. Your argument is, who cares? If it's going to be legal, if people are not going to go out there and use it anyways. I care about liberty. You care about liberty. That's fine. I respect that. And so, that you can't hurt anybody. By the way, just an opinion. You're a doctor. What's worse, marijuana, uh, alcohol? or cigarettes, based on your opinion as a doctor, which of those three is worse for you? Well, it all, all depends. I, I know that I'll give you the answer and I know what I'm, you're I'm talking asking about, very sincerely. it all depends on how much you use. You know, if a guy, if a guy smokes a cigar twice a week, you know, that's one thing. But of those three, I think cigarettes uh, are more deadly. More deadly. And what's second for you? Would it be C alcohol or marijuana? Oh, obviously alcohol. So you're putting cigarettes worse, then it's alcohol, then marijuana. Yeah, and somebody might find a statistic that shows that alcohol and cigarettes, you know, they're combined so often and give people heart problems. And uh, so what's I, I think overall, long term, society and freedom of choice would have made a much better use and a controlled use of marijuana. Uh, but uh, 
The market wor works pretty well with, with alcohol. Prohibition was horrible because they had alcohol and it was very concentrated, very strong, and also very contaminated. So when it became legal, it was much safer. And uh, matter of fact, Fair it enough. was when, when you had prohibition, you had much more potent alcohol. When you made it legal, you had lower percentage of alcohol and you could pick a weaker beer and this sort of thing. Markets can handle this. People, people aren't idiots. This idea that we have to control people is based, and, and the members of Congress told me that, it's based on assuming that people are stupid. And they've told me that. And they said, Ron, I agree with you. We shouldn't have to do this and all. But the people are too stupid. They're not going to do that. I, I assume that if you're going to be stupid, maybe you'll hurt yourself. But people aren't that stupid. Like that crowd show me. Nobody said, oh, I would use heroin. <laughs> They're not going to do that. Yeah, it all depends also what market it was you spoke to, how old they were, where the process, you know, where are they at with, you know, risk and accessibility. So, okay, so let's talk about the next thing. Uh, ending the Fed. You wrote a book based on a talk you gave. I think you gave a talk in Michigan, I want to say. And you were talking about the Fed. Some kids scream, end the Fed, and they start taking out, you know, <laughs> currency, and they're ripping it up, and they're throwing it, you know, all this other stuff. And it became this revolution-type revolution love behind it. That was your campaign, Ron Paul Revolution. And that led into you writing the book, End the Fed. So talk about End the Fed, because when I read the book, End the Fed, it is a very convincing book. If you haven't read the book, End the Fed, no matter how old you are, whether you're a Republican, Democrat, independent, libertarian, you don't care about politics, you got to read the book and the Fed. I want to mention that episode in, in Michigan, mm -hmm. because what you mentioned there is a very important point for me, is that I didn't, uh, of course, I talked about the Fed and that was my position, but it wasn't so much that I was up there lecturing the kids, uh, you know, what I want to do is end the Fed. All right, you people, it's a shout out, end the Fed, end the Fed. What shocked me, and the reason I wrote the book then, was they had heard this from other sources. That meant the educational process has infiltrated the climate. They weren't saying uh, legalize marijuana or something like that. They said, and the Fed, and the Fed. So they were already there. And uh, of course, they, they probably knew my position, but I thought that it was an encouragement to me to know that they, they already knew. About kind of goes that. back to how you ran for office, which was yeah, accidental. Yeah. You kind of inspired and you tell your wife. So, 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 so purpose of the book. The whole thing is, is uh, I want to end the Fed. We got to get rid of it. Central Central banking is bad. The world endorses it. Fiat money is counterfeit money. It's a source of many of our problems today, all these trade problems that Trump is harping on. It's, it's all related to the monetary system. Okay. And uh, it's, it's a tremendous amount of power. You can imagine what, what it would be like if, uh, if, if you came across a group that had the printing press and they could print money, but it was really counterfeit because it wasn't the government. And they would print so much, it usually would destroy the value. It would, you know, counterfeiting is so bad. The reason, well, there's so many reasons. First, it uh, allows governments to get too big. This argument's going on for a long, long time. But in our history, it went on with Jefferson and Hamilton. And Hamilton was for the central bank and regulating and control the money and all this. And Jefferson was against it. And they had just gone through the runaway inflation of the continental dollar. And that's where this slogan comes, not worth a continental, because they destroyed the continental dollar by just creating too many of them. So they argued it out. And nevertheless, uh, the Federalists created the first national bank, which was a road, a precursor to a central bank. Jefferson got rid of that. And then, then they put it, the second bank of the United States was introduced. They did the same thing. And Andrew Jackson got rid of that because he didn't trust the bankers. Banking control of the money is a powerful weapon. But then again, it evolved into the point, and any time there was a ruling on whether they have this authority, the courts always ruled in favor of the counterfeiters, the government counterfeiters. Mm -hmm. And the Constitution is very clear. The only thing that you can use as legal tender in this country and hasn't been repealed is gold and silver. That's the only thing that we're allowed to use. So we've disobeyed it. So it's unconstitutional. It doesn't make good economic sense. It's terrible politics. It's, it's the reason why- Is it, is it terrible politics? It, 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 or is it a convincing politics for the majority when a Bernanke comes out and says, you know, quantitative easing and that concept comes out and people say, well, this was used in Japan. This was used in UK. UK got 380 billion. Japan's done it multiple times. I think what you're saying on the short term. Yeah. But uh, but all. Me, what, and what I mean is not good for 
the economy, but politically, it's a good campaign to run because it's convincing. Because <laughs> well, the majority, how many, honestly, like how many people, if you're watching this right now, I'm really curious. I want you to tweet me and Ron Paul the following answer. Do you understand the concept of quantitative easing? If you do, I'm curious to know. The reason why I ask this question is the following reason. So you know how you said too many times, Americans, we pull out of trust into our politicians. So, oh my gosh, this guy looks so convincing. He's on TV, he must be smart. He went to a nice school, he's a UC Berkeley guy. Oh my, he's a Harvard guy, he must know everything. I should trust him to make all the decisions for me. And we throw a big word like that, like quantitative easing. If you were to explain quantitative easing in the simplest way, what does quantitative easing mean to you? You, you know, they, they have said that and people do trust the politician and they do lie and they demagogue the issue on the short run. But eventually, you know, the, the troubles come. Quantitative easing just means massive, uh, the creation of money and credit. So we had 0.8 trillion dollars uh, when the crisis hit and they took it up to 4.4 trillions and trillions of dollars of new money. Well, who got the money? The money serves the interests of the powerful bankers, other central banks around the world who are in trouble, other governments. I think they use this for military reasons. It's, it's secret. That's why the audit is so threatening to them. I concentrated on the audit, but that's when they get hysterical. No, you, you're not allowed to look at our books because this is why th th when you get into a financial crisis, all this QE, when it's painted and people do they get low interest rates and they buy houses but it creates the bubble that inevitably bursts and when the bubble burst in 08 and 09 uh, the very wealthy the banks got bailed out and the people who made all that money on the mortgages they didn't go to jail you know but guess who lost their jobs during that time and lost their houses it was the average guy that's right and, they, and you know that's right they they claim the economy is just right up there right now there's still a great division in this country on wealth distribution. Those people haven't all recovered. There's a, in, even in LA and mm -hmm. San Francisco, New York, San there's a lot of yes. homelessness that what we have done as a consequence of this brilliant idea of printing money. And one reason was is the people philosophically believed in that. It wasn't that, oh, I gotta do this. And that. No, they philosophically have been teaching Keynesian economics, inflationism, central banking, in our colleges ever since the depression. So we have a challenge. That's when I see a victory where kids are shouting, you know, in the fed. What, look at what we're challenging, a system that has been brainwashing our kids for generation after generation. So everybody that you see at the fed is going to have the same position. Yeah, yeah, uh, QE, uh, this much or this much. Now they're tightening. This whole thing is, they don't know how much money is necessary. They don't know what interest rates should be. It's all manipulation for special interests and to pay the bills like the, uh, to keep the military industrial complex going and keep the wealth. So, so Ron, going. this is why I asked you the question at the beginning when I said, you think a big part of politics is one, foundational beliefs where you're a true believer. You are a true believer. Everyone knows this. You just watch you, whether I go to 1986 when you were a guest, I think 1986 when you were on a guest on Morton Downey Jr. back in the days and you and him were going back and forth. It was a little bit sensational. Versus I watch you in the debates, I watch you in the things you write about. You're a true believer. Fair enough. Check. Ron Paul's a true believer. The next part is selling. You're a good salesperson, so you know how to sell your concept. You need to be, because you have to believe. If you believe, you can present, you can pitch. A good pastor, a good coach, a good parent needs to know how to sell the belief system past to the audience. But the third one is the part I, I ask you, and you were kind of like, you don't think that's the way to go to the top. The third part is a game. There is a game to be played. There's a political game that some people play the game better, end up making it to the top. My concern is that somebody's watching this. I've been a part of that for longest, but my mother's family were communists. My dad's side, they're imperialists. I didn't do politics because I was like, you know what? I don't want to touch politics because they're all manipulative. That's what I've heard of my entire life until eventually there was an interest for it. How do I, how do I read between the lies, the manipulation of politicians on both sides to know who is right, what philosophy is right to be pushing that concept? Well, essentially, what happens in order to see the change is you and others, and this is what's happening, is you just reject all of them. You know, all the politicians are saying, well, no, we don't, uh, we don't need this guy as head of the Federal Reserve, we need this guy. No, we need to get rid of the Federal Reserve. So you, you have to join the group now, 68, 70% of the people 
they don't believe our government tells them the truth. And that's really good because they aren't telling us the truth. And they say, well, you know, there'll be a tragedy. There'll be 9-11, there'll be Kennedy assassination, there'll be another thing. Oh, we'll have a commission. But the commission is set up and they lie to us. Now, you know, the Kennedy Commission, I think it's like 80% of the American people don't believe that Oswald was a lone assassinator. So this is a major step. You gotta reject the old in order to open up people's mind. So I think they have to hear it. So people who are in a position to influence others should do it. And uh, in my case, I never saw myself as doing this. I didn't, I didn't have a degree in economics and I didn't teach in a university and, and I didn't have access. But all of a sudden this opened up and I couldn't believe it. I, it surprised me. But you know, one thing that came out of my two campaigns is the Young Americans for Liberty. Are you familiar with that group? YAL. They have, I can't remember, I can't keep up with hundreds and hundreds of chapters around the country. That's changing people's attitude. I believe that. And they are also I believe pretty that. political too. Yeah. They're supporting certain candidates and they're winning some of these races. But they, they've done this right because the ideas have to change. Then you have to do it. Then you have to get the supporters. One thing that I also liked in Washington, because I knew how much of a minority I was, m many members would come to me and um, they would uh, say, they might vote with me on a tough vote. Okay. They say, Ron, I'm a libertarian on this vote. And I never had anybody come and say, you know, I can't do this or I'm going to do this because I'm a socialist. They, they don't use that. They started saying libertarian, freedom, responsibility. They wanted to sort of appease me and say, you know, I'm with you on this for good reasons. So that had happened, you know, toward the end of the time I was in Washington. And I think that's all positive. What I see on the campuses and the change in the philosophy, very, very positive. You create a movement with a lot of a young generation that's just all over the place you see them. I mean, you go to, I go places and I see, and the Fed, and the Fed, <laughs> and offices everywhere. That just means a lot of younger people are reading the content that makes them question things that's been conventional for a while. What, what surprises me a lot is, you know, I've said a lot of things what I'm worried about. You yes. know, this is too much debt, too much war and yep. all this. And probably if I speak to a group for an hour, maybe about 45 minutes will be, these are your problems. They're all yours. You have a lot of debt and look at the Fed and look at all this. And then I talk about why, and why things are moving directly. And People will afterwards say, you know, I like what you're saying because you're such an optimist. <laughs> well, that's good, but you know, I was saying a lot of things to worry about, but they want to hear an answer and they love to hear a positive answer. Some politicians are able to do that, you know, make America great again. I sort of think I fit into that category, but a completely different, different definition from Bernie Sanders or Donald Trump. And well, you've said nice things about uh, Sanders before. You've said really nice things about Sanders yeah, see, before. And, and, and this goes back to the nonpartisan stuff. Some of the some of the stuff that Sanders would would uh, say, I would agree on foreign policy. Uh, we supported the same bills and anti corporatism. Anti corporatism. And uh, but when it comes to drugs, Trump wants to put them all in jail. Uh, and you're not for that. So let me sure. ask you, who do you like? Like who have who's ever been a candidate where you've said this guy is a candidate? If I were to campaign and support somebody, I feel this candidate is a solid candidate. Well, and it can be you. And, well, I guess I, I guess it would be self-serving if I mentioned a, mem a member of the family. Yeah, okay, Rand Paul, I see. <laughs> so that people would write but that he's, off. He's, Rand is also a little bit further right than you are, though. Rand is a little bit further right than you are. I know he's your son, but he seems yeah, a he little bit more conservative than you are. Yeah, he has an approach, and I think uh, nobody can have the same approach that I have. I mean, everybody's going to vary because of I think individual. you're an anomaly. I think you are an anomaly. So when you kind of So what sit, are you going to do with me? What am I going to do with you? <laughs> We're here to try to figure your mind out. I want to know what see. your audience thinks. That's yeah, what I want to know. You have no idea how bad I will. Every single time he says something, send a tweet at Ron Paul. We're going to put the correct one here and Patrick with David. Can, can I name my website? Sure, of Because course. I do a daily program. I don't have the numbers that you have. I mean, wow. I, I I do a daily program and it's a streamlined. It's ronpaullibertyreport.com. By the way, you know what would be very interesting? Seriously, this would be very interesting. If it was me, you, Snoop Dogg in the same room together and you talked about marijuana. You know why? Let me explain to you why. This is why. 88% of African Americans vote Democratic. You know this, I know this. It used to be 60%, 64% back in 1960 before Goldwater. You were around to kind of see what happened with that transition there. Today it's 88%. It used to be 
I think if your message gets to, I'm Middle Eastern, most of our you know, people don't listen to your uh, views and what you're saying, except when you're on a national stage. If Middle Eastern, Hispanics, African Americans, many minorities heard that message, I think you can uh, spark a certain mindset in the minorities that maybe they haven't had before. You, you know, the, we've done a little bit of polling on this just by which groups are most anti-war, which I'm strongly, you yes, know, I don't like of course. these unnecessary wars. The uh, Hispanics are uh, very, very anti-war. Whether those statistics are reliable or not, but it was fascinating. It was probably done, you know, in my district, you know, a poll. I told Charlie Kirk, I said, Charlie, too many people that you guys are talking with, these concepts are all white. Too many. I was at his conference. He had a thousand people there. Five percent were non-white. I said, "We need more. We need more, not just younger millennials and Gen Xs. We need minorities to hear this argument." Currently, sixty-six percent of Hispanics vote Democrat. Eighty-eight percent of African Americans. You know, vote the Democrat. big the big problem in politics for myself would be, all right, uh, I'm talking to a minority group, and what are you going to do for us? I said. I don't deal in that way because I don't want to deal with you as a group. You're not important because you belong to a group. You're important because you're an individual. And an individual should be treated the same way. It's important for me to have data to know oh, what I my know. center shoots free throw wise for me to be able to go and address and enlighten that yeah, community. I, I think you have a lot to offer that serious. And I think the part that you can influence is the younger minority non-white in America. I really believe and, that. And we're doing pretty well on our YAL conferences on campuses. Okay. We, we'll get the minorities out. Very to cool. Us, so IRS, talk about the IRS. We don't, so, shouldn't have it. We shouldn't have an IRS. No. Now, today's tax code is a little over 74,000 pages. <laughs> Back when it got started, I think even 1913, when Federal Reserve got started December 23rd, 1913, our tax code was around 13 to 20 pages, give or take, right? Today, 74,000. What do you think about it? Well, I think if you endorse that principle, and most people accept it because they think they're going to get something back, but the whole thing is if you accept the principle, what you're accepting is that the government owns you. Self-ownership is part of the libertarian philosophy. If you philosophy. accept what? Well, if the you income tax. There's two things that shows that you let the government own you, and that is the income tax. Because if you make your $10 million this year, the government wants to come and take 4 or $5 million. Oh, I thought it was my money. No. The government has the right to keep whatever it wants. They have a total control of your income and they give you permission on how much you can keep. So you've lost your ownership because the harder you work, you know, if there's more socialism, the less you're going to get. So you've sacrificed your self ownership. And the other thing is if you endorse the military draft, if you say the government can come anytime they want, and I lived through, and I was in the service in the 60s, the tragedy of Vietnam. I mean, we lost 60,000 men. And what for? Insanity, bad ideas. And uh, that, that meant that the government, I had a school teacher that had been in World War II. He was drafted in, in, uh, in Korea before Vietnam. And he got killed over there. For what? You know, now we've had all those years over there prohibiting Koreans to talk to each other. And that was our policy. We never let the South go to the North. And that's why I love what's going on now in, in Korea, because it's the leaders, the people of South Korea elected a guy that said, we ought to talk to the people in the North. And that's wonderful. We just should let that happen. You know, let, let the people solve their problems. Let the people, individuals solve their problems and get rid of the IRS. So if we get rid of the IRS, yeah. what should it be? Should it be just a flat tax? I don't want them to tax your income at all. We didn't have it until 1913. We did pretty well. We had a lot of economic growth. Our biggest growth period was in the 19th century. Uh, you want everything to be private for the most part. Well, I, I guess there's a few things that we, we have to do, but I mean, the goal might be out there that it could work, but it, we're along so far away from that. We have to have a judicial system, but there, it's a rotten system. I mean, I think the judicial system is so unfair. How about enforcing the drug laws? Look how biased it is against minorities. Uh, so the judicial system is corrupt. And look at all this baloney going on with Russia Gate. They, people want to build this hostility toward Russia. They'll lie and say anything they can. They'll corrupt the justice system. We've heard so many lies and innuendos of who did what. I mean, th this whole thing, and it's going to be all the accusers of Trump 
doing these evil things with Russia are the ones who are doing it themselves. Yeah, that's right. So that's, that, that's the judicial system. It's a rotten system. So, but equal justice under the law is what we should be dealing with. But there's too many laws. There's way too many laws. Too many prisons. We have more prisoners than any other country in the world yeah. because we have too many laws. And we need a lot less laws. And if you have infractions, they should be done locally. So you, so you probably like the fact that the Trump is doing a lot of the deregulation. Whatever he yeah, does with was, deregulation, you're probably Deregulation. I think I think that has given some euphoria to the markets, has helped the markets, and the taxes helped him too. The more I listen to what you're saying, are your belief system fully possible to happen in America, or does it have to be done with a new country that's getting started with a constitution? I think what you're saying, the constitution has to be kept and held, and even some of the ways, I mean, the stuff that you're talking about, are we so into deep that there's no way in the world we can work backwards in those areas? In, in many ways, that's true. Because so how could you campaign around that if you know there's n there's no way in the world to... Because it's going to fall, fall apart. You have to have something to replace it with. I, I don't, oh, so you're saying if it falls apart, we have, some, we have no, a model no, to... No, the, the system is not viable. Our you don't think the system is viable? We uh, have this t nearly $22 trillion debt, $21 trillion that they gave to the Pentagon, and they have an audit that they don't know where it went. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to fall apart. So what are you going to replace it with is, is the big question. It's like the deficit. You say, well, are you, Ron, going to get a few more people and YAL is going to help you? That's all good because of the message. But will you get enough there where you can start winning the votes? You won't win very many votes. There are too many people, totally dependent. Before I went to Congress, I used to think it was the poor people, you know, too many people on food stamps. That's small compared to the trillions and trillions of dollars who own the Federal Reserve and the banking system. No, you have to get it to the point where um, it, it will have to be done when the bankruptcy is declared. We will have a bankruptcy. The dollar will not work, and we will have to do something, and they're lining up already. You're certain of that? I'm, I'm certain that it's a non-viable system because it's never been viable in 6,000 years of history where you can just <laughs> run out, compute. It used to be printing paper. Now you just use a computer. It, it's, it doesn't work. I, I think it's a, uh, how it works out is, it's gonna be, a, it'll be different. Uh, we don't know how it would do. I hope it doesn't end like Venezuela. I hope we get smart <laughs> before then. <laughs> we become Venezuela, that'd be a whole different story if yeah. we get to that but point. We're gonna, we're gonna have a, a rough time, but the only thing counts is how many people will endorse the idea that liberty is better than authoritarianism for solving our problems. That's the only question. What should the role of government be in a free society? And you know, it's no more complex than that. And you say, well, you're too much of a perfection. You're never gonna have it. Well, probably too, but at least, at least you know where you're going. Today, nobody knows where they're going in Washington. Here, let me ask you, the way Trump leads when you look at JFK, Reagan, and Lincoln, there's a couple things those three had in common. Politically, maybe one is left, one is right, but JFK probably today would have been more independent than a Democrat if he ran today. JFK would have been. He wouldn't have been today's Democrat or the liberal that we have. The one thing that I saw with those three names is they couldn't be controlled by money. They already, you know, they were not, they were true believers, all three of them. They had very strong opinions, and behind closed doors, they couldn't really be pushed around that much. Kennedy, uh, Reagan and Lincoln. At least that's what happens when I study history. And I see some of that here with Trump. Do you think that Trump is pushing the envelope a little too much? Or are you happy with the way he's going? Sometimes, you know, we mentioned regulations. I think less regulations is good. And I think less taxes is good. So in that sense, I, um, I'm glad that he flip-flopped on Korea. So when he flip-flops, sometimes I'll give him credit. And that's what my program does. When he does things like that, I do it. I try to stay very independent. But when he treats Iran like they're doing, you know, and say, well, what I advise now is nobody should buy one gallon of gas from Iran. I don't, I don't like that because I believe trade is good. You know, that's what we want. We should be trading with Cuba. So he doesn't have a basic principle, even though he has some libertarian instincts, he's an interventionist and he's very much of an authoritarian. And that's not a good place to have an authoritarian because the executive branch in this government has way too much power. They can start wars and they're getting ready to have another uh, authority to use military force pass into Congress, which means we're going to have perpetual war against any country in the world. And right now, you know, we're bombing 60 or 70 countries. We're in 120 countries. 
that's all going to end. And to me, I think that would be a blessing. That would be a blessing. You know, if we could talk to the Chinese and the Soviets when they were pretty monstrous, uh, it was a benefit. At least the Cold War ended, you know, and we weren't threatening us. But now some people like to, well, that's not good for business. We need to sell more weapons. So we need to stir up trouble. It's those Russians. They've caused all the trouble. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't quite buy into that. So on the border side yourself, with all the talks right now with border, where do you stand? Because libertarians, they're 50-50 on border. You hear yeah. some people saying, well, you know, it should be open border. It's about liberty. And some say, no, we need to leave it to the state. No, it should be federal level. What do you think about borders? Well, in, in my book, Liberty Defined, I have a chapter in there about borders. And I think what you do is you have to uh, remove the incentive. You know, if you subsidize something, you get more of it. So if an individual can come in and barge in, and to me, it's similar to barging in your house. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants them barging in your house, but barging into our country is like our house because we have to pay for it, mm -hmm. you know. So they barge in, and they do end up getting into our schools and, and medical care, and they get an easy road to citizenship. That shouldn't be, you know, we shouldn't do it. So if they weren't rewarded, they wouldn't be doing this. And it's just too bad that some of the, some of the mess that's in Central America, we've been involved in Central America, many years, uh, you know, interfering, you know, uh, most recent Colombia because it was drugs and different things like that. And there's a lot of poverty. We'd have done much better off if we would have had a private group inviting people up here and teaching them Austrian <laughs> economics, teaching them what free markets are all about. That's what they need. And they don't need just more dollars. What's unfortunate is what we offer most countries is, uh, you know, if you come our way and do what we tell you, we're going to give you money. If you don't, we're going to bomb you. And if you mess around on wanting to get rid of the dollar as your reserve currency, we don't like that and we'll get rid of you. And look at what happened in Iraq and Libya, you know, and, and Assad was too independent for it. Was that a Republican saying Assad had to go? No, that was Obama, the peace candidate. <laughs> That's why... Uh, Similar to another president like Carter who kind of influenced the Shah to be gone in Iran as well. There was a lot of influence there as well with the... Uh, connection. It was like, hey, you know, Iran's having a little bit too much power and they're coming up and they're about to pass UK and all this other stuff. Well, we can't have Iran have too much control. And then we saw what happened with that afterwards. Half a million people died when a war started between Iran and Iraq. But fair enough. That, that's interesting with the borders. How about education? You're a big supporter of uh, changing the entire educational system. You and I are on the same page with that. I wrote a book called Drop Out and Get School because I'm not a very big fan of the current oh, educational great. system at all. <laughs> uh, so I think a lot, and, and the stat I was reading about was the following. I, I, I want to know what you think about this. So currently today, you're a big supporter of homeschooling, which is about three to four percent today's homeschooling, right? Private school used to be 11.2 percent. I think it's dropped off to 9.7 percent. And then the rest public is 86 percent, okay? is what we currently are. Those are the ratios we have currently today. What direction would you like to see that take place in the future? Well, my, my program, the Ron Paul Curriculum, is uh, homeschooling. You say 3 4%. But, you know, to change a country's attitude, you don't have to think in terms of uh, majority. You don't have to say, boy, Ron, you have to convert 51% of the people. I so noticed you said 20%. That was a number no, you talked I, about. I think 8% I think eight, eight or so of people who think about these things if they're speaking the right message and they're in the right places, they yep. can influence it. Because, you know, even when, when our own revolution occurred, the average person was sort of, uh, you could criticize some of them because they, they were ambivalent about what was going on. But the leaders, they were very, very philosophic and they knew where they, they were coming from. But they were definitely less than 10% of the population. Maybe they're 7 or 8%. So that's why there should never be discouragement. How are you ever going to convert people? So actually, we sort of offer our courses to people who, who want to be involved in promoting ideas and promoting the libertarian philosophy. You're recommending See, parents take charge of your kids. Don't let the government manipulate your kids or brainwash your kids, whatever word is. Take control, take the responsibility, start teaching your kids the right things. Is that yeah, kind of where oh, you're... That, that is it. And I think that uh, we should be very encouraged by that. Do you think parents are afraid of doing that? Do you think parents are, I'm wondering, I don't know if I can do it, or do you think we're just lazy? I to think there's it? a lot of that. There's a lot of that? Okay. <laughs> I wonder whether I'd have been patient enough and I was busy I, delivering babies oh and my all gosh. this thing. So uh, yeah, I got no, three it, myself it would be tough for some people. But there's the answers to that. There is uh, private schooling and maybe five families could get together. All kinds of things that could adapt. You think a four-year degree today has as much influence as it once used to have? Like, hey, 
you know, you don't have a four-year degree. I don't know if anyone's going to hire you in the free marketplace. Do you think it has that much influence today as it did 30 years ago yeah, due to the... In certain areas, it in does. Certain I areas think if you does. want to go to a big firm, you got to have credentials for law firms and even businesses, they want you to have a master's degree. But the average person, you know, somebody was asking me, what would you have done if you didn't get into medical school? I said, looking back, I probably would have said, I think I'll be a plumber. <laughs> I think I'm going to go out and I'm going to be the best plumber in the world because I don't have to go to college to learn how to be a plumber, you know, that sort of thing. It's pretty, yeah. Or be a salesperson, entrepreneur, a lot of that stuff, you can do it. But I think when it's specialized, engineer, doctor, lawyer, yeah, you, got, you, I can't you need do some schooling for that. To, I'd yeah. have to have the degrees. You, that, that, and we have uh, four grandchildren that are in medicine. Three of out of our five are MDs, and then there's uh, four grandchildren. You're building a team. That's exciting. I'm, I'm still at six, four, two-year-old. I still have little babies. I'm way, <laughs> I'm just a startup. So, so, okay, so we talked about that with education. Would you support a, you know, Mark Cuban's a big Ayn Rand guy, big. I was sitting with Mark Cuban. I gave him an original sleeve, original cover. Uh, Atlas shrugged to him. He was very pleased. He had never had something like that before. Would you support if he ran out and says, I'm going to run for president, I'm going to run as a libertarian. Would you support somebody like a Cuban? Do you would, think that would be good? I, I, I don't know his views well enough. It would be sort of like when Trump started running. I had no idea what his views were, and I still don't. You still, people still don't know what his views are. I still don't know what they are. the wall is going to be built. Somebody, <laughs> say, somebody asked me about something. I said, as of today, this is what we're doing. <laughs> so, Mark, I have, I'm not mad at him. And right now, the only contest would be how good he's at tweeting. <laughs> he is actually pretty good at tweeting. He? So he's, he's because got, Trump's an entertainer. He, he has his main well, thing. Well, Cuban is trying to become an entertainer, but he owns a sports team, Shark Tank. Is there anybody out there that he said, if he threw his hat in there, I'd support him? Like, I know Schiff was a former economic advisor to you. If he ran, would you support it? Are you a fan of what McAfee is saying, Consider himself as a you know, libertarian cybersecurity guy because that's the biggest threat we have in America? Is there any names that you actually would like to not, see get in the ring. Not one that pops up that I would know all his beliefs. I'd want to talk to him, and I might do so something. So you're taking the safe route. They, is what you're um, but there would be some like in Congress. If my son ever ran again, you know, the obvious of choice course. would be there. But yeah. there's other like Thomas Massey and Justin Amash. Uh, these are real good voters, but there's only, unfortunately, about a handful of them, you know. So they're there. Were you a Gary Johnson guy? I read some stuff that you were not a Gary Johnson. No, no I, I didn't think he was... Uh, you like Stein uh, a good more presenter than even him. for it because if there's any one place that you better be as pure as you can is when you're trying to set a standard. You don't have the license in a in a third party. You you wouldn't want a socialist running and saying what I really want is to build GM or something like that. Yeah. You, know? you, you are more for when the collapse when market collapse happened, let GM go out of business. That's where you are more well, that's, for. That's what's supposed to happen. Yeah. If if they mess up, they mess up. Otherwise, let you know, the people who get bailed out are the ones who have to buy influence, and that's the system we still have. Yeah. Yes. But what I'm saying, it's going to end. You're saying it's the going to end. The bankruptcy is on our doorstep. By the way, the $21 trillion debt that we have, you're not including all the unpaid commitments that we have with Medicare, health care, all no, this other stuff. that's over 200 That's over 200 That's two, a, that's two, a, $200 trillion. That's over, a scary uh, number, by the way. That is a scary number, especially with the fact that we are living longer. So that could be even a bigger should number. That scare a lot of people into looking into our philosophy. So here's what I would say. I was in Greece four days ago, okay? I was in Greece four days ago in Athens. And we held a meeting, and one guy showed up, Panos. I'm going to say Panos because there's a million Panos in Athens. So Panos <laughs> like St. John, so it's not, uh, uh, you know, trying to pinpoint. So they come together and say, Pat, what can we do to change the economical system here in Greece? I said, you guys ought to go out there, start the biggest revolution with young entrepreneurs talking about capitalism, and start studying the concepts that helps you all these great minds that were raised in Athens and, you know, Greece, you ought to be inspired by some of these people. So my suggestion to anybody that's not even in America, but if you're not in America, you're all over the place. I suggest go buy all his books. Literally start with Liberty Defined. It's good. The, you know, book you have about revolution, about with the educational system and the Fed. I think it's a fantastic book, but go one by one by one with the books he's written and study his content. I think 50 years from now, 100 years from now, people are going to consider the man sitting to my right. They don't have to agree. I, I don't sit here and just, you know, I don't know if I agree with that. I don't know if I agree with this. 
But the point is, everything's going to basic fundamentals that challenge all sides of politics. And I think that's very healthy for your processing to become better in politics. It makes you question everything. Because initially, especially when I said, we got three people here that are libertarian, maybe one is socialism. I was being sarcastic. First thing you said was what? That's good, because someone's going to make our arguments get better. That was his immediate answer, having an opposition. So I suggest you go read his books. I suggest you follow some of his content. You do have a YouTube channel yourself as That's well. Right. I noticed that. And if you watch this, again, anything you heard, especially quantitative easing, <laughs> quantitative easing, anything we heard today that was of interest to your question, send me a tweet, send a tweet at him. I'm really curious to know what you took away from today's episode. And with that being said, Dr. Ron Paul, Great. thank you so Good much to for be your with time. You. Truly enjoyed thank it. Thank you very much. Really enjoyed very it. Very nice. Thanks for watching, everybody. By the way, be sure to subscribe. Take care, guys. Bye-bye.